coming up next on NMZ Live TV. Up next on NMZ Live TV. The psalmist declares in Psalm 95, Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Good day, and welcome to another virtual service. My name is Pastor Sharice Evans. I'm the pastor of the women's ministry here at the New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, where our senior pastor is Pastor Alfred Stewart. We are located on 590 Blue Hill Road, south of Halton Road. You can also find us on our Facebook page. Please remember to like and share our page. You can also find us on our YouTube channel where you can watch past as well as current broadcasts from the ministry. If you wish to be a blessing to the ministry financially and partner with us as we fulfill the Great Commission, I invite you to contact us via WhatsApp. Our number is 341-3726. That's 341-3726. Or if you just want to find out information about the ministry, the various services that we render, or if you wish to have counseling or prayer, you can contact us at the church. Our number is 341-1804. That's 341-1804. Our speaker this morning is Pastor Theophilus Claridge. Pastor Claridge is the pastor of the children's ministry. He'll be speaking from the topic, where's your focus and if we look around us there's so many things that's happening globally that would cause us to have our focus on what's happening but this morning pastor claridge has come to remind us that we need to be focused on jesus christ who's the author and finisher of our faith so after the praise team would have ministered the next speaking voice would be that of pastor claridge hear ye him as he declares the word of god Hallelujah. They were in an upper chamber. They were all on one accord. Come on, let us come with the right mind, the same mind this morning as we worship our God. Hallelujah. Just for who he is. Glory be to your name, Jesus. Glory be to your name, Jesus. Come on. If you have to kick your shoes off this morning, throw it off. Just break loose this morning. Just the loudest spirit of God to have this way in your life to live this morning. Hallelujah. Glory be to your name, Jesus.
second week of 2021, a year with new possibilities, a year with new experiences, a year with new hopes. But as we embark on 2021, with all of the uncertainties that come with a new year, we are still experiencing the affects and effects of 2020. The repercussions of the SARS-CoV-2 that we commonly call COVID-19 pandemic is still here with us. We still come and worship and we still travel the day with masks. We get out our vehicles and we have to sometimes remember, oops, we have to go back to get the mask. And this is all part now of life that we are living in. But not just with the effects that we are suffering, having to wear masks, but we think of the economic repercussions that we are still suffering. And the economic uncertainties, and then think about parents, and students, and teachers. How we have to navigate this COVID-19 force that has put us into virtual learning. Where the child who is so good at the laptop, the computer, the tablet, but all of a sudden is having, having difficulties with schooling. All of this is outcome of 2020. And if we as Christians are not careful, we can allow the realities that we face and the realities of life to cause us to lose focus. 
And today, as we forge into 2021, we want to gather our bearings as believers and to fix our focus on the one who will sustain us and keep us in 2021. For the next 30 minutes or so, we want to focus on the topic, where's your focus in 2021? Where's your focus? Where are you focusing in 2021? And for a text, we want to look at the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read right now from the King James. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, right now for these few minutes, we ask your Holy Spirit to move amongst us today. Because we need to hear from you, Holy Spirit, not from me. Lord, we need you to guide us as we look through and as we prepare for this new year that we are in. And so today we ask your spirit to fall fresh on us. To mold us, to melt us, to make us into your image. So that we could run the race that is set before us. And our focus can be on the one who ran the race, race before us. Amen. The treatise of Hebrews, written by an unknown author, a lot of scholars believe it may have been the Apostle Paul, was written to second generation Jewish Christians who were suffering persecution from Jews, because they turned from Judaism into Christianity as well as from the Roman authorities for their faith in Jesus Christ. And I hope you notice something that we're going through and I've picked up that for last year and this year even as we were going through various studies, this one thing of persecution kept coming through. I just want you just to touch base on that, to notice that he was writing to Jews who were believers who were persecuted for their faith. And as a result of the intense persecution that these Jewish believers were facing, they were on the verge of abandoning their Christian faith. They were on the verge of giving up. And they were deciding that they were coming to the point where, you know what? This ain't worth it. Let's just return to Judaism where we could at least know at one part, one party of the two parties who are persecuting us going to accept us back. The main purpose of this treatise was to encourage the Hebrew Christians to continue in their faith and to show them that salvation comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. Now when we reach this 12th chapter, the writer here is admonishing the believers as to where we are to place our focus. Notice the first phrase that he uses in verse 1. It says, wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now in the King James, the word here uses wherefore, in most modern translations, they use the word therefore. 
and both words are conjunctions that tie what was said before to what is going to be said now. We have to connect them together. And he wants us to make sure that we understand that there's a connection between chapter 11 and what he's going to say in chapter 12. Now we also got to remember when they wrote the Bible and they wrote these letters, they didn't have chapter and verses. And so he is connecting these two together. And he's connecting what he told to us about faith in chapter 11. And all of those saints that have gone before us. And you know the ones that he mentioned. Just to name a few, we, he talked about Abel. He talked about Enoch. Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua. And he went on to talk about various saints who went before us and how they lived their Christian lives. And you notice when he spoke in chapter 11, he didn't make, he didn't mince words, he didn't pretty the picture. Their whole life story, and these were Jewish believers who would have known the Jewish history and they would have known of every one of them, their faults and their successes. And for us to fully grasp the analogy that the writer is using, we have to picture the Christian life, and this is what he wants us to understand as a race. Now we have to understand this race he is talking about, this is not a sprint or short distance race, you know, like the 100, 200, or 400. There's nothing like those. None of those kind of races. Not even the middle distance races. You know that some of us like to watch when we get down to the 800, the 1500, you know, the, the, the 3000 or the, the mile and those, the mile, those races that we, you know, you can still watch in one sitting. Not even the long distance races he's talking about. You know, these are the ones now that you see the start and you see the pack together and you decide, okay, I could wash some dishes. I could... Um, Vacuum, because you know, once they've been race start, you ain't gonna see the end right away. You know, we're talking about the 3,000, the 5,000, and the, you know, the daddy of them all is the 10,000 meter. You know, they're the ones you see, and all of a sudden we start looking, and especially us in the Bahamas, everyone who start to get and look at, oh, he get lap, he get lap. You know, that's when you see them start lapping each other. But the apostle here, he is talking about running a marathon. See, he's describing the Christian race and the Christian life as a race where we are running a marathon. This ain't the one where I just go there and then I stop. And when he is describing this race, he is telling us that there are some people who went before us. There's some people who ran this course that we are now on. And they have set an example for us. But not only they set an example with all of their faults and all of their, um, 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 uh, um, the tragedies that befell them. He's telling us that we can emulate them because they finished the race. But he also shows us that with all of their mistakes, we can avoid some pitfalls along the race. I like how the message translation puts it. It says, do you see what it means? Referring back to chapter 11. All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans are cheering us on. And here's the good thing that we have to understand. Where he starts out is those there who have gone before us, they have not only set the pace. And if you notice in some races, they have what they call the pace setter. Those, especially those distant races where someone is running and they set the pace and then that person drops out. But this is a different type of pace setter. You see, they set the pace, they finish the race, and now they're cheering us on. 
and they are encouraging us to finish the race. Now, after reminding us and informing us and, and making sure we understand that we have a cheering squad who has run the race before us, we have a cheering squad in there who is cheering us on to finish the race. The first thing we want to look at, the apostle says, in, in order to finish this race, there's some things that we need to do. And I want us to notice he didn't say there's some things that you can put to God and God can do. There's some things we need to do. Yes, we need the help of the Holy Spirit, but there's some things we need to do. You see, the first thing that he says that we need to do is we need to lay aside every weight, and there's a second half to that, and the sin. The message again puts it this way. It means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sin. You see, when we're going to lay aside, is we're going to find out what's going to cause us to stumble. When we think of that marathon, and that race, and that runner who is going out there, you notice he doesn't go there with a suit, tie, um, um, heavy shoes, you know, um, army fatigue. He tries to get as light as possible. He takes off anything that's going to cause him to fall. And you see, we as believers, when we are preparing this race, we have to do some introspection. As we are run, not just as we're preparing for, but as we are running the race, we need to do some introspection. What is it that is hindering us from moving forward? Here's how Jadegi Sunday describes the weight. He says, there are anything that can hinder or disallow us from successfully running the Christian race. It is anything that retards our spiritual growth or weakens our faith. It can exhaust, in other words, anything that can exhaust our spiritual strength and break our spiritual focus. And he goes on and he names just a few things to bring it to focus where we can understand. You see, spiritual weight, my brothers and sisters, they can be unbelief. Notice what Jesus said when he went to Nazareth. And he told them, and the people turned him away. Because uh, the, 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 the epithet that reads on that city, it says, because of their unbelief, there wasn't any healing. He did no miracles there except for a few healings. And sometimes, when we're running this race, we can allow unbelief to hinder us. You see, we have to be like that father when Jesus was up on the Mount Transfiguration, and when Jesus came down and disciples was trying to heal this son of this father, this epileptic son. And the father said, Lord, I believe, help thou my un." Belief. You see, we have to acknowledge and we have to lay aside the unbelief. Sometimes we got to take God's word and say, Lord, I don't fully understand it. I don't fully, really, it, it makes no human sense to me, but I'm going to stand on your word. You see, because that goes to the second thing where Jakey said that we have to look at is sometimes not just unbelief, but we can have a lack of faith. We may not believe what God says. You see, we can have a head knowledge, but we don't truly believe in our heart what God says. These ways can be, for example, when you look at worry, 
anxiety. Jesus says, be anxious for nothing. But Paul said that, be anxious for nothing. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, he talks about worry. He says, why are you worrying? He said, God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the flowers. If he could take care of them, what are you worrying about? But you see, we allow worry and anxiety to pull us down sometime and to sidetrack us. And worry and anxiety causes us sometimes to do some things that may get us off track. Friendships and relationships are another two things that can cause us sometimes to get sidetracked and to weigh us down. Unhealthy business partnerships. See, sometimes as believers, we can be in a business relationship with someone. And that can be a weight because that person does not have the same standard that you know that you have and that you know God's word says. And so you're going to have to compromise. All of these, just to name a few, are things that can weigh us down. There's some of us, our jobs can be a spiritual weight. Our job is going to require us to do some things that are contrary to what God's word said. I remember years ago, back in the 70 year friend, was a coupier. And when he became a Christian, he gave up that job and everyone said, man, you stupid. Man, something wrong with you. He says, what I was around in that environment in the casino, he said, I had to give that up to go find something else. He says, because that environment was going to pull me down. And you see, we have to know, sometimes we have to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Because where I'm at, I'm not strong enough to handle it there right now. And so when we look at a weight, we have to understand anything that is going to distract us from wholeheartedly following Jesus is a weight. But you notice he didn't say, just lay aside the weight. He says, lay aside the sin. See, there are some weights, and some of these weights can lead to sin. And sometimes we have some sin dwelling in us that we got to put aside. And I like here how the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Galatia, he puts it. He named some obvious sins. And just so we in 21st century can understand, I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. When he describes these obvious sins, as the Passion Translation describes in the King James says, the works of the flesh. Sexual immorality. Now he getting blunt to the point. Lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of after God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of ourselves, being in love with our own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. Paul concludes that section in Galatians 5 when he says, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, when we go in through the race, the apostle Paul says, there's some weights we got to lay aside. There's some sin we have to lay aside. 
Notice the Apostle Paul to the Galatians when he stipulates these things. He says, if we continue to practice these things, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. So that means the first thing we have to understand, if we're going to finish this race successfully, there's some things that we got to lay aside, some things we got to put aside. That means we have to do an introspection of our lives. And too often, we don't like to do introspection. When the prophet Nathan came to David and gave David this nice story, about a rich man going and taking the poor man's ewe lamb. And David, with all his righteous indignation, first he looks there and he says, this man should die. And then Nathan looks right at David and says, thou art the man. And it says right away, David knew what he was talking about. And sometimes we got to do some introspection and we got to be like David, humble ourselves before God and say, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way within me. Because we need God to open our hearts to see and to show us so we can lay those aside. But you notice the second thing he says, not just we have to lay aside some things, not just that we got to put aside the weight and the sin, but he says we have to run this race with patience. You see, my brothers and sisters, when a marathoner is preparing for the race, the runner and his or her coach, they put in place a race plan that will allow the runner to finish the race. And you see, they sit down and they anticipate what obstacles that the runner may encounter. But as believers, we have to understand we have a race coach also. But here's the good thing about our race coach. He doesn't sit with us beforehand and plan. As he sits with us, he is running with us as we are on this race. And you see, that's the Holy Spirit who is there, who is guiding us, who is directing us, who is telling us which way to go. It also comes from when we spend time in God's Word, where God's Word is going to tell us, no, 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 we got to, uh-uh, that way ain't the right way. We, this is the way you got to go in. It's the Holy Spirit and God's Word who's going to tell us, no, so, no, slow down here, slow down here. We don't understand. You see, we don't want to be like Balaam when he was going there and he going headlong and he rowing his donkey and the donkey got to look at him and say, what you beating me for? Say, you don't see the, 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 the angel in front who ready to kill you? The Holy Spirit is there. He is not only our coach, but he is running with us. And the apostle says we have to run this race with patience. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to help us to avoid the pitfalls of life. But also when we spend time in God's word, we also see the pitfalls that befell those who went before us. And don't ever think, that can't happen to me. Peter, the night before the crucifixion. Lord, if no one else, I will die with you. Lord, I go into the end. And even though Jesus warned him and said, Satan is coming after you. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. He says, but I have prayed for you. Peter goes there, and every time they come, me? Come on, you get the wrong fella. Not me. And it says, the last time it says, with cursings, all of his fisherman language came out. 
And it says, when the crock crowed, he looked up, Jesus looked at him, and he wept bitterly. You see, you could understand, you see, we, Peter was thinking, I, not, I ain't failing you, Lord. I'm going with you to the end. And so that's why we have to spend time in God's word. You see, if you're going to run with patience, it's in God's word where we see the pitfalls that befell those who came before us. And then we could also look to Jesus because you see, not only the pitfall that fell before those who were witnessing, but Satan came to Jesus. And notice how Jesus dealt with it. It is written you see that is what we have to understand when we're running this race we have to patiently run our race i cannot run anyone else here in this room race i have to run the race that is set before me you see we are so tempted at times to feel as if we are the only ones facing difficult challenges in life when we get there, we can look back at those who went before us. And they're cheering us on. And we can say, okay, I have a problem with whatever it is. If you want to say it's lying, okay. What tripped up Abraham twice that he would lie and say Sarah was his sister? Instead of his wife, even though she was his sister, but still his wife. He didn't say he didn't want that wife part to come out. What happened? Now, yes, God came in and God did some intervention. But at the same time, when Abraham listened to Sarah, man, God waking too slow. And Sarah says, man, go with my handmaiden. And to this day, we still have war. You see, those are some things that we have to look at. That's why we have to look back at those who went before us. Because they're going to help us. And that's why we have to run this race with patience. We have to be patient and we can't get before God. You see, we may stumble, we may fall, but we could also look at those who have gone before us and found out, found out, and find out how they dealt with it. One of those I really like is Samson. When you think about him, Samson had the looks. I mean, everything about him. You know, some of you females, especially the younger ones, you all could name the star that you all going to, you know, he had the hair. And, you know, he's been the one who you'll picture with the hair. Um, what 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 the, the fella name back in the eighties and the Fabio or something with the hair blowing and that's where you picture a Samson all of the muscle of a Arnold Schwarzenegger and all of us coming there and he's walking there and Samson really thought he had it and notice how he allowed his self pride to cause him to fall. But notice how when Samson went about his life, it didn't start as a, it started small. And when you read of Samson, you see all the small things. Taking the carcass of, a, eating the honey of the carcass of a dead animal. Think about it. Going and intermarrying. Deciding that he wanted a Philistine wife. Until he hooked up with Delilah. You know, the French musician Camille Cesson, when he wrote his opera, Samson and Delilah, there's a, a verse a, 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 that is sung sometimes at weddings, a song from the opera. And English simply says, my heart at thy repose does unfold like a flower. She sweet talk him to the point. He was like, man, okay, 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 okay. But what led him to that point? 
But here's what I like. When they came and they captured him, and Delilah said, The Philistines are upon thee. And that third time, he did like this, and nothing happened. And notice what they said. To make sure, we're not just going to jail him. They blinded him. But I like when it comes to the end of his life. You see, when Samson got to that point of his life, where he knew that the Philistines was going to kill him because they had this big party, and they decide, let's make sport of the Jewish hero. He asked a little boy to lead him to the center post. The post that was holding up the temple, because you see, they, they forgot one thing. Somewhere deep down in there was still that faith. And that hair started to grow. And when he got there, it says he put his hand and he grabbed those selling posts. And when he pulled, it says, and the epitaph read, reads, that Samson killed more when he died than while he lived. And sometimes we look at those and we see the comeback. But what could have been if he never went down that train? And too often we look at these saints and say, yeah, but Samson, come back. But who says you're going to come back? Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Anyone who commits those sins shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, God could get to the point and say, wait a minute, I've given you enough warnings. I cut you off. You see, we have to our epitaph has to be like that of David. When Samuel went to anoint David, and he went through all of his father's sons, is there no more? Well, there's the little boy out in the field. Go bring him. But I like what the Lord said about David beforehand, and David gives us the example of how to persevere. Because you may come across some shortfalls, but when you stumble, you have to get back up. Because it says, when we look at David, that a man after mine own heart. That's what God said about him. But notice where the, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Yes, he says, you have to endure. You have to go to the end. You know, Jesus says, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Yes, you have to lay aside some things. But the final thing he tells us today is we got to have a focus. You see, when a runner is out there running, this runner is not looking all around. The runner has a focus where he is heading to. He knows that this one may pass him. He is following the plan that he has set with his coach. He ain't going to push too fast because he knows what pace he has to take. But notice what the apostle says here in this says, if we are to successfully complete this race to the end, it says, we must focus on the main one who went before us. We have to have our focus fixing our eyes on Jesus. We have to be like a racehorse. If you ever watch any race, you'll notice that the horses have blinders on. And the reason why is it, it, it helps the horse to focus ahead. If not, the horse might be distracted by who is coming on the side of us. And you see, we have to be the same way when we are running the race. 
this Christian race, because our focus has to be on Jesus. Because we might see this one coming, well, how come he get ahead of me? Don't focus on him. Focus on Jesus. You know, sometimes they tell you when you were in running, they tell you, don't look behind. Because when you look behind, you, you, you can get too comfortable because you can say, oh, man, I'm not, that's the... you look in this way, oh, he, oh, he way back. But you forgetting then who here? Focus ahead. He says, looking unto Jesus. The message translation puts it this way. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we are in. You see, Jesus was on this race. And it goes on in the message, says, study how he did it. You got to watch, you got you to gotta read about what Jesus, how his life. When you look at Jesus, notice, Jesus not just lived his life, okay, I'm the son of God, oh, that's cool, so we go. When you read the scriptures and the gospels especially, and it looks and the disciples get up in the morning and say, but they went to look for Jesus. Where do they say he was? He was somewhere praying. Whenever Jesus had a spiritual victory, when they turn around, they look for him, he was praying. You see, too many of us, when we have our spiritual victories, we look back and we puff ourselves up. We could be like Elijah sometimes, and, and we could go there, Lord, it's only me. Nobody else is checking for you. I tired, Lord. Just take my life. You see, when we take our eyes off the prize, we then can falter. Our focus has to be on the one who went before us. You see, the world tells us that our focus should be on getting rich, on obtaining power, on obtaining success, on obtaining beauty. And you know, some of us will go and we will, and there's nothing wrong, and I know I need to do it, like exercising. But some of us exercise to the point because we don't exercise for health reasons or whatever. We exercise because we want to have the look. There are some people who will spend money on clothes, on making sure the hair flows just right. You see, the world says, and if you watch the ads, this is what you need to focus on. I need the latest car. My neighbor gonna have a brand new BM who? Oh, but I need to outdo her or him. You see, that is what it is when we look at, and this is what the world is telling us. But as Christians, we must realize that the world is not our maker, nor our master. And we have to stop following the world. You see, because when we follow the world, we get sidetracked. The world will tell us what to believe and will tell us how we should act and how we should say it. And we follow in step. And so often we are consumed by the world's standards rather than being consumed by the standards of the one who holds our life in his hands. You see, my brothers and sisters, we can't focus on two destinations. Just like Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You either gonna love one or you gonna hate the other. When we start focusing, we have split focus, we then have some problems coming in our lives because we get continually distracted by what the world puts up there, oh, that looked good. Oh, but uh -uh. He says, focus on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You see, when we allow the world to 
guide us, we're going to come to some crossroads. And the Holy Spirit is saying, this is the way walking in it. And what do we say? Oh, Holy Spirit, this look a little, little better. And as we start to follow, we find out that we see to the first turn. And when we reach that bend, we don't see, we realize, we, start, we don't realize right away, you know, because, you know, it's like in the airplane, when you're flying, and sometimes you could, well, something ain't right, but you realize there's a slow turn. And you realize, one minute, something ain't, that's where we hear, hear it, when we follow the world. Satan makes it look good. And we have to be careful, it says, we have to fix our focus on Jesus. Our eyes must be steady, looking unto Jesus. And notice it says, he started our faith and he's going to finish it. The author and the finisher of our faith. And yes, he endured the cross. We don't know what our lot may be. We don't know what persecution may come our way. But if our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we know where we're going to end. You see, my brothers and sisters, when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we understand that he is the one who provides all good things for us. We understand and we let the world become a blur. We don't, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we, the world has then become, it, it, it's like the horse with the blinders. We don't, they don't see what's around. They see what's ahead. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we allow God to magnify the right ministry opportunities. You know, sometimes we hear, we may get in business meetings and we say, Pastor man, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? This church doing this. And pastors say, the Lord ain't lead me that way. Fixing our eyes on Jesus you see, when our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we spend time connecting with God on a daily basis. We see those in need of love. We are focused on the needs of others before ourselves. We are not focused. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we're not focused on the TV on social media, on all of the other distractions. And all of those things are distractions. And if you're a political junkie like me, when is the political season, you won't flip from all of the channels. You won't see what everybody's saying. And then you realize you could be up all night. I remember a few years ago when they had the British elections. Now, I ain't talking about the American, I ain't talking about ours. The British elections, I was up all night watching the returns. You see, when we are, our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we understand that God has big plans for us. And we know that God is greater than all of our circumstances. You see, in 2021 now, even there are persons who were, who were called back at the end of 2020 and all of a sudden the job tell them, oops, well, the tourists ain't coming like we thought they would have come. So um, we can put you on furlough again. But you see, when your eyes are fixed on Jesus, you say, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't like it. I hate it. But I'm fix my eyes on you and I'm going to trust you. Even if you have to make sure sometimes, you know, sometimes you close one eye so you can see properly. You point so you, can, you can't see that, you know, you're sometimes with two eyes open, you may see a little double. Uh-uh. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we will know that God has not forgotten us. In the midst of everything. We will know that God is alive, well, and aware 
of all things. You see, we got to understand that. And that comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we know that God will rescue us and God will restore us. You know, the praise team sings uh, invitational songs. Sometimes God restores. When our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we know no matter what happens, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we will not miss out on what God has for us. You see, my brothers and sisters, we have to come to this place in 2021 where our focus has to be on Jesus, the one who died for us. I like how Helen Hayworth Lemuel um, puts it in her, the chorus of this song. In the chorus she says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. As we continue in the remaining 50 weeks of 2021, my brothers and sisters, let us continue to focus on Jesus. Let us continue to always looking unto Jesus, the author and the completer. I like to add one of the modern translation, the, the author and the completer of our faith. Because when we focus on him, he will guide us through. Father, right now, these words you have given, Lord, seal them upon the hearts of the hearers, Lord. Help us to focus our attention fully on you. The distractions of the world will come, Lord. But we remember, Lord, that if we are going to successfully finish this Christian race, not just in 2021, but in whatever time you have on this earth for us, we know we have to be focused on you. And so, Holy Spirit, now again, seal it. Bring it to remembrance to each of us, not just the Harris, but to me also, Lord. We bless you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning into this broadcast. I know that as a result, you've received a blessing. And I want to challenge you as you go throughout this week. Make Jesus Christ your priority. In doing that, you will remain focused. Once again, I'm Pastor Sharice Evans. Have a wonderful day.